In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We open with C.F.W. Walther's prayer for the first Sunday in Advent. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, whenever we begin a new church year, we had to come before you in shame because of the sins committed in the past. Today is no exception. We are again laden with the burden of guilt. Lord, are you not tired of having mercy upon us? No, you are not. You are God and not man. You are Jesus, the same yesterday and today and forever. Though we may forget you, you will never forget us. Though we forsake you, you will never forsake us. Though we may be unfaithful to you, you will remain ever faithful, for you cannot deny yourself. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be moved, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Trusting this word of comfort, we on this first day of the new church year approach you and beseech you not to remember our unfaithfulness. Come again through word and sacrament with new grace, new blessings, new protection for your whole church, for our city, our congregation, our homes, and for all of us. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. The term Advent is from the Latin, Advento, to advance or to press forward, to march on, to approach, and also Adventus, a coming and approach and arrival. In itself, of course, the word really is not that extraordinary. It may be applied to very many things other than that eager expectation of the advance of our Lord Jesus Christ at the culmination of this age. It's just to say, of course, that vulgar and common things have advents too. But so it is that our holy faith redeems words, catches them up, and applies them to the most salutary things, indeed, to God himself. You might, for example, christen a king. You might christen a ship. But in fact and in truth, there is one King of Kings and one Holy Ark of the Christian Church, one Christ, to whom all christened things point. Thus and so it would seem that even this term Advent is universally recognized now as having something to do with our Lord Jesus, even by unbelievers who will not have our Lord on the one hand, or Christians who have iconoclastically abolished the use of the church year on the other. In our midst, then, this season ought to be held with all reverence and appreciation. Now, in the historic lectionary, the Sundays in Advent are called by Latin titles. Advent 1 is called Ad Te Lavavi, taken from the first line of our Intuit Psalm, as every titled Sunday in Advent is. To you, O Lord, I lift up, ad te lavave, my soul. It's often pointed out that when we speak of this season, we refer principally to three advances or three approaches of our Lord Jesus Christ. His first advent that we anticipate as we look forward to the celebration of his nativity is coming in the flesh for the sake of the world's salvation. His second advent, as we heard from the epistle reading, is that expectation of his return in judgment with the resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. And then miraculously, and most wonderfully, we likewise refer to his third adv advent, that is his constant advance and approach in the Holy Gospel purely preached and the sacraments that are administered according to the Gospel. But there is another advent or approach during this season, and it isn't to be overlooked. Another advance and uh, another forward press, and it is that of the Christian to God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. 
It's true, of course, that the Holy Christian Church makes as her constant prayer that Aramaic phrase, Maranatha, that is, O Lord, come. And so, even Walther's prayer ends this way, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Indeed, the whole canon of the sacred scripture closes with our Lord's promise, Behold, I am coming soon which is also followed quickly by the petition of the Spirit and the Bride, that is the Church, who say, Come! And then an invitation is extended. Let the one who hears it say, Come! That the day of our Lord would be hastened. But then, at the end of Revelation 21, St. John writes, quote, And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And so we also prayed in our hymn of the day. O oh Lord, how shall I meet thee? How welcome thee aright. Thy people long to greet thee, my hope, my heart's delight. O oh, kindle, Lord most holy, thy lamp within my breast to do in spirit lowly all that may please thee best. The repentant sinner must come to the Lord Jesus by faith if he would be saved. Now, are Lutheran ears attuned to the proper distinction between law and gospel as they are and must be, might very well hear this as an admonition, which then we're tempted to sneer and to balk at and say, are you saying I must do something to be saved? But of course, this, and let the one who is thirsty come, is not really an admonition in the way that our ears perhaps have been mistrained to hear, any more than our Lord Jesus' words in Matthew 11 are an admonition, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. These words represent rather gracious invitations that both invite and draw the same faith that they also create. These are not admonitions any more than if somebody worked in the heat of the sun and some passerby walked along and said, come and take a drink of this water. If the guy dying of thirst said, don't tell me what to do, well then I suppose he deserves to die because it's not a command or an admonition. It's graciously giving what the thirsty man recognizes he needs. And so when we refer to faith as the empty hand that grasps, or the feet that come, or the mouth that eats, we're not really attributing anything to man. For faith is not your work after all, but is an organ of reception. And it exists because of God's powerful working. In fact, to the Ephesians, St. Paul writes that the same power by which our Lord Jesus was raised from the dead is at work to bring one from unbelief to faith. So if somebody does indeed think that faith is their work, uh, well then they need only read this passage and to see that faith is brought about again by that same power which revivified the Son of God after his rest in the tomb. And that faith eagerly waits upon God's gracious invitation to come. To come and meet the King and rejoice in his coming. For Jesus will come, dear Christians. It's not a matter of whether or not but when. And when he comes, what kind of people will he find? Will the Son of Man find faith on the earth? That's a question he himself asks in the Gospel of Luke. And in the parallel account from Luke 19, when our Lord descends on Jerusalem, he weeps with a compassionate weeping that only God possesses. He weeps because in that city, the city that bore his own name, the city that had and had uh, the habitation of his own dwelling in the temple, he found nearly no faith. And so he cried out, If you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you, when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you and on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. The king has come. 
and the king continually comes, and indeed he will. And what sort of king is this to whom the Christian comes? Well, to none other than the king of heaven, who though being the son of God from on high, nevertheless descends into the lower regions of this world in order that he might gather unto himself a people to be raised from the lower regions of this world to that glorious an eternally established kingdom of his. And so, like any king, he marches. But unlike any king, he marches on to offer his life as a ransom for all. Faith, therefore, is not so much commanded and coerced to come to such a one with knees forcibly pressed into the earth in fear. And rather, faith is drawn with near irresistibility to the God whose chief characteristic is this, that he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so faith ought be no more offended by his lowly appearance on a borrowed beast of burden than it would be by the manner in which he appears before the whole church until his glorious reappearing. Here our Lord comes in much the same unassuming way as he rode into Jerusalem. And so faith believes the prophet Zechariah. Luther makes much of this in his sermon for Advent. He says that we should note that the prophet Zechariah says, Say to the daughter of Zion. And then he says, Let our ears teach our eyes. What we see with our eyes is this poor beggarly man riding in on a donkey that's not even his own. What our eyes now see our measly means. And so we must allow our ears to train our eyes. It is no surprise, Zechariah says, your king is coming to you. How? Humble. A strange king indeed. And because of the paradox of his powerful humility, he wins faith's admiration and praise. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after signs, but faith seeks after the promise of the king wherever it happens to be. His promise may be joined to the lips of a lowly, scorned prophet like Jeremiah, who suffered unspeakable things because he stoutly preached the word placed into his mouth. And when people asked, why are you saying these things? He simply said, thus saith the Lord. He says them because he's given to say them. And the promise of God is that the words he desires the people to hear are coming out of this guy's mouth, who's at the bottom of a pit waiting to die. God's promise may be seated on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. It may be under water, bread, wine, word. And so powerful is the humility of Jesus. So overwhelming is his manner that it replaces those foremost images of salvation in the Old Testament. The people's escape from the land of slavery in Egypt, which was supplanted by their promised return from the Babylonian captivity. So Jeremiah writes in our Old Testament text, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country, and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. Each of those occasions were shot through with the eternal testament of the Lord's promised salvation. And it culminates not so much with a bang, and not so much with a whimper, but with a cry of dereliction and the voluntary giving up of the life of the Son of God. And now no longer do the people of God say, as the Lord lives who brought the people out of Egypt or Babylon, but rather, as the king who rode humbly into Jerusalem, and even more humbly still allowed his life to be handed into death lives, so too is our hope who come to him who has come. So come, dear Christians, as often as it is called today. Come, for today is the day of the Lord's visitation. Besides this, as St. Paul writes, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And indeed, that's a gracious promise. 
which will be true and even more so tomorrow than it is today. And so on and so forth until the one to whom we sing our hosannas descends with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. But come without fear, because as the prophet Jeremiah writes, in his days Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That is the one in whom our acquittal before God is found. The one who declares us free of guilt and every sin for the work he accomplished in his death and his resurrection. And so how shall you meet him? How welcome him aright? Well, by faith, dear Christians, which trusts his word is true. His word that declares to you that the Son of God has indeed assumed a true human nature. His word that declares he will come and is coming quickly. And most of all, his word here that our Lord Jesus is indeed present to and for you, even to the end of the age, for he gives you this pledge. This is my body. This is my blood given into death and resurrection. Eat and drink. The king hears the plea of his people, and he comes always for your forgiveness and for your salvation. Hosanna to the king. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.